Well, good evening, brothers and sisters. I'm uh, pro-life leader Frank Pavone, National Director of Priests for Life, and this is Praying for America. I'm here once again alone tonight in our uh, studio, but with you, our family, and I know we already have a very good audience because two big things that we want to talk about tonight. Of course, we planned this episode, and I will talk about the case of Terry Schiavo, the uh, Brain-injured woman who was, by court order, dehydrated to death in 2005. I was very involved in that case. I was one of the few people in the room. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, Because nobody saw what was going on in that room except a handful of us. Not even the cameras uh, were there. And then, of course, just a little while ago, the news media began reporting that uh, the uh, New York um, uh, district attorney made, well, an unprecedented uh, error, an unprecedented twisting of the American system of justice, not going after a crime in search of a person, but going after a person in search of a crime. And boy, did they make a big mistake unless they secretly want to see President Trump as the 47th president of the United States, which is what's going to happen. It was going to happen anyway, but now it's going to happen by even uh, bigger margins. And uh, yeah, just sit back and watch. No, actually, don't sit back. Get involved. But those of you that aren't going to vote for him, sit back and watch. Boy, are you going to be, your heads are going to be Spinning off, going up into the sky. We're all going to stand there and watch the, watch the heads going up into the clouds. You're going to be so absolutely overwhelmed with, well, I don't know what it is. You surprise if you're dumb enough to not to recognize the political impact that this is going to have. Uh, filled with rage at the stupidity of Alvin Bragg, and I, you know, just you know what, advice to the left. Keep keep trying to pull what you're pulling here. And you just, just keep it up. You will never be in political power again. Your whole party, your whole wicked, sick way of thinking, you'll never be in political power again. There's a reason that this is unprecedented. And we'll talk about that. All right, first, let's turn to the Lord and pray. Psalm 100 says, cry out with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness, come before him singing for joy. Know that he, the Lord, is God. He made us his we are. We are his people, the sheep of his flock. Go within his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts with songs of praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. Father, we pray to you tonight, blessing your name and coming into your presence with great and tremendous joy. We thank you, Lord, because we are your people, the sheep of your flock. We praise you for what you have done, and we ask you to continue to do it. That is, bring us close to you, make us holy, protect us from evil, and bless our whole nation as we come into your kingdom. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, friends, um, we did a program what was it, back on Monday night, going into in some great detail this uh, farce going on in, uh, uh, in Manhattan. It got a lot of views. And uh, everybody who has an ounce of understanding of the American system of law uh, understands that, as I said at the beginning and as I explained at length on that program, our system is built to start with a crime And then go in search of the people who did it, right? You start with the crime. You know what it is that was done. And then you go see if you can find who did it. You don't do what the Soviet uh, communists, KGB, did, as the head of the secret police said to Stalin. Find me the man and I'll show you the crime going after a person in search of the crime. Why is our system built in such a way that you don't do that? You don't go after a person 
especially because that person is your political opponent, or go after his or her supporters because you oppose the whole movement, and then try to look for something that they did wrong. This is what the left is doing, not only to President Trump, but to all of us who support him. I even face this garbage in the, in the Catholic Church, where some of the hierarchy who are in bed with the Democrats, literally and, phys- and, and figuratively, are weaponizing the, the, the structures and processes of the church to deprive people like me of uh, the ministries that we've been doing for uh, decades. Of course, in my case, they haven't succeeded in stopping my ministry because it stands on its own, juridically and financially independent of the bishops who want to see this work stopped. What work do we do? Well, we try to end abortion. We try to protect children's lives. And because we're trying to do that, we support the one who is the most pro-life president in our history. They go after a person in search of a crime. How many crimes have they tried to, to pin on him? How many are they trying simultaneously right now to pin on him? Whether you're talking about a phone call made to Georgia... Uh, a non-existent illegal uh, record changing in in in, uh, in New York, or a January sixth incident. Uh, but what? It, it, how many more impeachments, Russian hoaxes, Ukraine? It all piles up after a while, and that while was actually a long time ago. The American people say, well, no, this is, a, this is an inverse. This is an upside down, inside out version of what our system of justice is meant to be. Fine. You know what? Keep it up. Those on the left, keep doing what you're doing. Because you are literally putting yourselves claiming, begging for and claiming and and cementing on your foreheads the insignia and the title and the identity of those who try to completely undermine the American system of justice. And guess what? Americans don't support that. They might not even be supporters of President Trump, but there's enough people out there who have enough love for America to say, wait a second. I've got to stand on the side of my country. And that's what I want to call on those who are on the fence about President Trump, or maybe they love his policies, or they, but they think, oh, well, now it's time for somebody different, that the things have changed now. This hasn't happened in American history where either a president, a sitting president or a former president has been indicted. Now, and remember, indictment is not guilt. A study what an indictment is, study what a grand jury does. It's not an adversarial process like in a courtroom where you've got to have both sides and it's got to be, you know, if there's exculpatory evidence, it's got to be presented. And and there's all this back and forth. And the the person on trial has uh, some measure, at least on paper, of uh, uh, equal rights and a defense. That's not what this process that leads to this moment is. It, 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 it's a it's a it's a it's a one-sided process. This is the way it's constructed. That's why you know illegal experts. The, the, the saying is, you can indict a ham sandwich. You, you can't. Anyone who look, you look at at again legal experts in American law and uh, and practice will tell you if a prosecutor wants to find something against you, against me, against anybody. You look, you dig deep enough into the law books. If you've got that notion of going after a person in search of a crime, you can find some kind of violation on anybody. You're going after the person. You're persecuting people. So, you know, look, we'll see how uh, the legal process itself unfolds. But this doesn't... It being indicted, even being found guilty, indictment is just, you know, we have a, a suspicion here that there might be 
guilt of something done wrong. Of course, then you have to, you know, go through the process. And, you know, the prediction of many observers is that there would be an indictment that in New York, in the New York system, because of its cemented Democrat identity, uh, he would be even found guilty. But on appeal, this case isn't going anywhere. And the, you, you, you appeal this, you get, get out of that New York swamp. Let me tell you something. Uh, there's never been a weaker case. Uh, than this. Only those who are blinded by Trump derangement syndrome can come to the conclusion that uh, that this has been some kind of a crime. And those who jump on the bandwagon, the anti-Trump bandwagon, and say, oh, you see, there was something wrong that was done here. You don't know what you're talking about. And you don't even see uh, the blindness that your syndrome, your derangement has caused you because there is nothing we had discussed and we analyzed, we're not going to have time to go into it all right now, but we analyzed in our program the other night, as so many other commentators up and down and across the country have done, uh, as to why this doesn't hold up. And an indictment only makes the other side look more ridiculous because when it goes up, Further in the process, and especially going up to appeal, it's going to be a, a, a spectacularly embarrassing uh, uh, going up in flames of a uh, legal effort. And all that does, fairness-loving Americans, freedom-loving Americans who have the maturity to put their disagreements, political disagreements on one side, and their love for America on another, and their love of a fair process, are going to end up doing what so many have already decided to do. And that is to vote for this man and make that a statement about how we want to see our legal system be conducted in the future for our children, for our grandchildren. I mean, if we now, if we're going down an unprecedented road. If we now go, now go down this road, how many more political opponents are we going to see treated this way? This case was looked at already on the Manhattan District Attorney's level, on the federal level, by the Department of Justice by the Federal Election Commission. It was looked at already over and over again and dropped. The facts haven't changed. Boy, is this going to be, you know, the, the Democrats don't know how to stop embarrassing themselves. They really don't. Let, 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 let's, let's sit back and think about something for a moment. What, what became of the search for documents in, uh, the raid on Mar-a-Lago. What became of the uh, impeachment hoaxes? What exactly was the crime again? Of the first impeachment, the second impeachment? Nobody even knew when they were when they were doing it. Going after a person in search of a crime. Let's pray, Lord. Uh, we see once again. Another clear sign of who our 47th president will be. America now has to choose more than a president. America has to choose how our justice system is going to be conducted. And Lord God, we, we invoke the Holy Spirit over our citizens that they may realize that that is now baked in, cemented in to their presidential election choice. It's cemented and it has become so obvious. It has become so plain. It has become so dramatically a choice between equal justice under law, which is blindfolded, or justice peeking out of the blindfold, looking at the face and becoming injustice. This is not the America we chose. This is not the America our founders built. And this is not the America we want to leave to our children and our grandchildren. And so, Lord, yes, let there be the arising at the voting booth 
of a deep and clear commitment of your people to use their vote to build a nation, to use their vote to affect consequences far beyond who is sitting in the White House, but rather on how this nation will conduct itself in our enforcement of the law, in our investigation into crime, and in our treatment of our political opponents. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, let me switch gears. I was in the room. I was in the room. It was this day, 2005, that I was in that room in the Pinellas Park, Florida, in the hospice there, where Terry Schiavo was. Terry was a brain injured woman. Now, she had been brain injured, not brain dead, brain injured. For quite a few years, there was some kind of an incident, some kind of an accident. The only people who were there were her and her husband, Michael. Hey, Mike, you watching? You know what happened that night. None of the rest of us are sure. Why don't you tell us, honestly? They had an argument, that much we know. And then Terry was pretty badly hurt. So Michael for reasons that he has yet been honest enough to explain, didn't want even basic rehabilitation given to Terry. Now, it wasn't just ultimately what happened that her, her food and water were removed from her. And, you know, that kind of causes some bad consequences like, I don't know, maybe death. But he didn't want even basic rehabilitation given to her. Oh, what well, she had to use a feeding tube. Yes, why? Because she wasn't given the physical therapy to learn how to swallow, maybe? Oh, but she was, uh, you know, uh, uh, impaired. Why? Maybe because they weren't opening the shades in her room even to give her sunlight? You don't, you don't realize it wasn't just the food and water that were deprived of her. It was basic human care. I was there. I and my colleagues that were there with me in Pinellas Park talked to the volunteers. We talked to the nurses. Now, how did I get into the room? Understand what happened. We're going to compress this long story into just the highlights here. But I'm going to tell you a, a dramatic, some dramatic things I saw in that room and some things I didn't see that some people are still imagining were happening. Big battle erupted between Michael Schiavo, who ended up being the estranged husband, ended up marrying somebody else, having children. And, and meanwhile, Terry is there in this brain injured state. And he says, no, no care, nothing. Now, Terry's parents... Her mom is still living. Her dad had passed away afterwards. And her brother and sister said to Michael, hey, you can go. You've already started a new life. Farewell, goodbye. For some reason, you don't want to take care of Terry. We'll take care of her. We won't hold anything against you. Just leave. Say goodbye. But no, Michael wanted to hold on to that power over Terry and get the court to enforce his decision to completely deprive her of the most basic care, food and water. Now, friends, food and water are not medical treatments. When you go, go to dinner, when you come back from dinner, do you say, I just came back from my latest medical treatment? We all understand on a basic common sense level that medical treatment is very different from uh, food and water. And yet, this is where we have to have a lot of of, of um, revision in state law, because a lot of state laws put food and water into the category of medical treatment. So that then, when a person invokes their right to refuse medical treatment, and we do have that right, nobody, you know, we're not saying, I'm not saying a, there always has to be every possible treatment and medication and intervention and machine and surgery uh, uh, ad infinitum. No, there comes a point where there is such a thing as a futile treatment. 
There is a point where there is such a thing as a worthless treatment. What we're saying is there's no such thing as a worthless life. There's a big difference, my friends. There's a big difference. If a person gets to the point where they're dying because of some underlying condition or disease, and a treatment is either going to be an impossible burden for them or their family. Let's say somebody has a disease and, and, and there's a treatment for $50,000 a month, but you have to fly to Germany every month to get it. That's not a burden that, 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 that most people are going to find. Anything less than intolerable and impossible. You, you, you don't have to do things without ever stopping to, to prolong life. All we're saying is you can never take life. It's a big difference between the two. You can never take life. There is such a thing as a worthless treatment. There's never such a thing as a worthless life. What was the case with Terry here? So Michael was saying, you know, we don't even want to give her food and water. And there was pushback, of course, from her loving mom and dad and brother and sister. And they said, we'll take care of her. Michael would have none of it. Hey, Michael. You've yet to make clear to the American people and to the rest of the world how on earth that makes any sense. Okay? You've failed, and it would be nice if you kind of told us the truth. Put that aside for a moment. What happened then? What well, became a big court battle? It ended up involving the U.S. Congress and the President of the United States at that time, George W. Bush. And I was involved as well. How did I get involved? The family, knowing at that time I was doing you know, these, these national broadcasts, just like I'm doing now. And um, the family saw me talking about the value of life, talked mostly about abortion, but I also talked about end of life issues. And they reached out to me and they said, could you help us get Terry's story out there? Can you help us advocate for her life? We, we want the court to decide to, to leave it in our hands, not to order that her food and water be removed. So I did get involved. Now, at a certain point in the court battle, the family was told and Michael Shiva was told, you have to give us a short list of who can be admitted into Terry's room because we're going to limit the number of uh, visitors. They knew me, again, from my TV broadcast, so they put me on the list. I was one of only a handful of people in the world who was able to go into Terry Schiavo's room in that hospice in Pinellas Park. By this time, now that we're, again, now we're talking 20, 2005, right? People were saying, 2004 actually, 2004, 2005, people were saying, oh, well, she's in a persistent vegetative state. That's not a precise medical di diagnosis. Those of you who are doctors know what I'm saying. It's not a precise medical diagnosis. It can mean a whole bunch of, 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 of things. And people listening to that persistent vegetative, think of a vegetable, vegetable just sits there on the, on the table, right? No, no movement, doesn't talk. Oh, well, let me tell you what. I, when I visited her, this is before her feeding was stopped. Now, people say, oh, well, she was on a feeding tube. The tube was inserted at the time of the, when she needed uh, a meal and, and, then, and then taken out. It wasn't like she was hooked up to machines. What kind of machines, what kind of life support was she on? What kind of machines were in her room? You ready? None. Let, 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 let's just pause on this fact here. Friends, there were no machines in Terry's room. I am an eyewitness. I was there in the room. I know what a machine looks like. I know what wires look like. I know what things hooked up to the mouth, going in the nose, going in the mouth, going in the veins, tubes. I know what they look like. They weren't there. Nothing. She was breathing on her own. Her heart was beating on her own. As a matter of fact, the only problem that she had physically speaking, now understand what I'm saying, was the brain injury not some kind of terminal disease? She didn't have any terminal disease. She wasn't dying of cancer. She wasn't dying of something else or eating away at her body. No. The body was functioning in a healthy way apart from the fact that the brain injury limited her ability to communicate. Limited, did not eliminate, but limited her ability to communicate and to swallow. But again, neither was she given the physical therapy to try to, to do better. Now, what happened was 
I would go into the room. Now, her dad, who's since passed away, was a funny guy, and he loved to joke with her. I was there with her dad. He was telling her jokes. Friends, she was laughing at his jokes. He had a mustache. He would bend over to kiss her, and he would say, here comes the tickle, and he'd bend down and kiss her, and she reacted to the, to the, to the tickling. I prayed over her. Now, if I stop, as we do during this program, and, 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 and I say, let's pray, don't many of you close your eyes, bow your head, join your hands, but you close your eyes a lot of times, right? Well, I started praying over Terry. She closed her eyes. When I said amen, she opened her eyes again. When I walked around the room, she followed me with her eyes. And when her parents and I asked her various questions, and her brother and sister, I heard her voice trying to respond. We couldn't make out the words, but I heard her voice trying to respond. Now, this is, I'm just sharing with you what I saw and heard. You make the decision. Was she a vegetable or an injured human being? If you see a person laughing at, at, at someone's jokes, responding to a tickle, closing her eyes when she prays and opening them up again, what, 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 how do you describe that? She's interacting in some way, shape, or form with her environment. Now, let's not mistake the argument we're making here. The argument is not that the value of life depends on how well it functions. Does, your, does the value of your life go down when you're asleep? Of course not. The value of life doesn't depend on your ability to talk or to move around. Does a, does a, does a person who has limited motion or who loses their limbs or, or has some other kind of uh, partial uh, uh, paralysis suddenly lose their value? Value does, the value of life doesn't depend on productivity. And this is the philosophical difference between those who wanted to just discard Terry, considering her life worthless, and those who wanted to love and save her, starting with her parents and her siblings. What I'm saying is I'm counteracting the lie of the other side. And that's why they got so mad at me. Michael Shivo and his attorney, by the way, the attorney was a right-to-die activist. It didn't have to be that. Attorney is just supposed to protect somebody's rights under the law. But this guy was an, a right-to-life activist. I wonder if you're watching, Philos. You've got a lot to answer for. So what happened was I would go into the room. I'd experience these things. Now, then well, March 30th came. And now, of course, the, the, the feeding tube had been removed. The final, final outcome of this drama was that the court decided definitively that this food and water be removed. They exhausted all their appeals in the legal process. And for some two weeks, she was lying there without even a drop of water. And at that point, on March 30th, was her next to the last day. She died on the 31st, tomorrow. So I was there that day in her room as well. No longer was she responding. She was lying there, and her face was frozen in a look that I would describe as a combination of horror and sadness, fear and grief combined. Oh, I looked at her for a long time. Her face was frozen in that look with her mouth open. Two things. She was panting very, very rapidly. <laughs> and her eyes, the eyes were wide open. But they were darting vigorously back and forth. Now, this was on the 30th of March. This wasn't in all the other times that I visited with her where I told you how she was interacting. By this time, she had been without water for, for two weeks. And the other side kept going in front of the cameras and saying, oh, you know, this is uh, she's uh, a, a dying a peaceful and dignified death. It wasn't peaceful. It was, wasn't dignified. It was horrific. I was there. I'm one of the few people in the world who was in that room. And brothers and sisters, we prayed over her. And you know who else was in that room? Besides me, the mom, the dad, the brother, the sister, and a few others who were authorized to be there. You know who else was there? Get ready for this. Five armed police officers stationed around the bed. 
if anything ever rem reminded me of the crucifixion of Jesus, the Roman centurion standing there, five armed police officers standing around the bed, During the night of the 30th, we were in that room most of the night, and then I came back again the morning of the 31st, and it was clear that she was going to die within a matter of hours, and she did uh, die that morning. I, at a certain point, was kneeling down next to her, and I was like this, right? Now, in my hand, I had a little timepiece, because when I was going back out of the hospice, on the street in front of the hospice, the street was closed, and it looked like, you know, when there's a, um, a county fair and there's all these booths lined up one next to the other, you know, different concession stands and games and everything, except they were media outlets from around the world, around the country and around the world. Larry King was there, and uh, uh, Anderson Cooper was there, and Sean Hannity was there, I was, and I went on all these programs telling them and telling those who were watching, and I know many of you were watching, I see some of the, your comments. Uh, and I was describing what was actually going on in that room. And meanwhile, Michael Shivo and his attorneys were coming out talking about how beautiful and peaceful it was. Well, they were mad at me because I was ripping the veil off of what these people were saying. And here's the most memorable thing. And if you haven't heard me say it before, it will be one of the most memorable things for you. Here's a woman panting for lack of water. I was sitting next to her on her left side. Her brother was on her right side. I reached out my hand. I could touch her head. When I moved my hand this way, the table right next to her bed had a vase of flowers on it filled with water. Terry Schiavo, human being, dehydrating to death, panting and her eyes vigorously going back and forth, a vase of water, beautiful flowers in it, drinking up that water, growing, flourishing, life versus death. Nurture the flowers, kill the human being. Brothers and sisters, I turned to those police officers and I said, have you ever seen anything like this in your life? And one of them responded, no, and I hope I never do again. But when I was like this, praying with my eyes closed and I had that timepiece in my hand, I felt a tap on my hands. It was one of the officers and he said, uh, Father, what do you have in your hand? And I said, oh, it's just a timepiece. I, I, I have to keep my eye on the time. I'll have, to, I'll have to hold that. I'll have to hold that. Why did he have to hold that? They were there to make sure that neither I nor any of her family members nor anybody else would give Terry so much as a drop of water. That's why they were there. If we had tried to dip our fingers in the water in which those flowers were immersed and put it on her lips, they would have arrested us and taking us out of the room. As a matter of fact, they arrested some little children who were outside the hospice, who literally took a cup of water and tried to enter the hospice to bring the water to Terry, and the police arrested the children for trying to bring her water. And the children said, but Jesus said, give drink to the thirsty, and if you give a cup of cold water to somebody, you will not be without your reward. And the judge told those children they did the wrong thing and that they had to write an apology. And when the children wrote the letter, they said, I would do this again because Jesus told us to take care of one another. That's the culture of death. The law, the courts, instead of doing what they're supposed to do, protect human life, this was a court-enforced murder. Terry would not have died if her food and water weren't taken away. She would not have died. 
There was no underlying disease. There was no ventilator. There were no machines, tubes, wires. She was living and breathing on her own, her heart beating. And, like I said, before the water was removed, interacting like so many other people are right now. In limited capacity, yes, but not limited value. Friends, get... <sighs> look, whatever people think about how you determine the value of life, please don't let people get away with twisting the facts of this case. I'm telling you the facts as an eyewitness. That's not something I read or heard some commentators say. I'm telling you the facts as an eyewitness. She was interacting with her surroundings. She was not on any machines. And her death was not peaceful and dignified. It was horrible and terrifying for us who were around her and for her. Let's pray. Lord, we... Uh, are struck with sadness and confusion, Lord, over how we, on American soil, <clears throat> can treat an American citizen like this. Lord, should not there be some limit to the freedom we have to decide how we're going to treat each other or not treat each other? Why, Lord God, would a man do this to his wife? And if he didn't want it, if he, if, he, if he just lost the love and lost the will to be kind and generous and helpful, well, he was given the option to just walk away. But no, he had to have her killed. Lord, there's no other way to describe it. And so we ask, Lord, for the consolation of her, her siblings and her mom who are still, who is still with us and now that family speaks out for others who are vulnerable in the same kind of situations. Lord, we thank them for not being absorbed in grief and anger or withdrawing, but rather for establishing an entire ministry to help those who are in these circumstances. We praise you, O oh God, for that. And we pray for the many, many other families who are facing such situations with many, many other Terry's. Lord, give them help, give them consolation, give them peace. Now let's pray in the words that Jesus gave us, including all of your intentions, brothers and sisters. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, you can find out more about this case and see in writing what I've told you and more details as well by going to priestsforlife.org, that's the our ministry website, slash Terry, T-E-R-R-I. That's priestsforlife.org slash Terry, T-E-R-R-I. And uh, share the story. Share those details. And again, no matter what people's opinion is about this, don't let them change the facts. Because while people have a right to their opinions, they don't have a right to their own set of facts. The set of facts is what it is and should be a lesson for us all. The family wrote a book, A Life Worth Living. There uh, made many books actually written about Terry. But the family's book, of course, is the most poignant one. You'll find information about that on the website as well, priestsforlife.org slash Terry with an I. Friends, thanks for joining me. We went a little longer than usual here tonight, but big, big, big developments. So this indictment of President Trump, it's only going to strengthen uh, the MAGA movement uh, and uh, the anniversary of Terry tomorrow. Tomorrow is called Terry's Day. I say some extra prayers, especially for the vulnerable in our society and uh, that our laws will 
incorporate a little bit more compassion rather than even allowing something like this to happen. God bless you. We're praying for you each day. Follow me on social media at FR Frank Pavone on all the uh, major platforms. And uh, we'll be back with you uh, tomorrow. Appreciate your commitment to America. Oh, and please consider supporting our work. Uh, you can do so at ProLifeGift.org, ProLifeGift.org. We're working to save lives of the unborn and the born alike. And, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> thank you for your nice comments there. Um, uh uh, all of you are giving such great comments. I appreciate that. Uh, and consider supporting our work, prolifegift.org. Thanks, friends. Talk to you tomorrow. God bless.